We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. So here we go again. Another sermon and I never quite feel ready. You know, you'd think after 14 years, I would feel confident, but I'm always nervous, always insecure. I mean, I know that I know that God is powerful, but I feel so weak. Worthless is more accurate. No matter how much I work or how hard I try, I never feel like I have what it takes. All right, Mac. Smile. Don't suck. <laughs> Game on. That may be an interesting way to, to open up a, uh, a sermon, um, but I, I can't be the only one that before you're doing something, you're just bombarded with thoughts of insecurity, doubt, fear. Um, and it's, so it's always a, a privilege and an honor, and those of you who don't know me, my name is Pastor Mack, and um, uh, I don't ever take any time on this stage for granted. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that I do with uh, great reverence and respect, and it's just kind of one of those moments of, I'm going to take a step forward and allow God to, to do what, what he does on the stage. And so we've been in this five-part series called Run to Win that's based off of 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. And Paul, he's been using this metaphor of an athlete that's running a race emphasizing discipline and self-control um, with purposeful effort. And so we've discussed what spiritual health looks like, what physical health looks like, what relational health looks like. Last week we talked about financial health, and today we're going to talk about something that I'm extremely passionate about, and we're going to talk about mental health and emotional health. And so if you have missed any one of those series... I encourage you to go onto YouTube and check out all of the previous four on there uh, because all of these things, all of these messages are designed together because how you deal with financial health or how you deal with spiritual health affects how you do deal with mental health. They're all designed together. And so let's just start off in prayer, and then we're going to dive right into Scripture and get going here. But Father God, we are just humbled and honored again. We're thankful for the freedom that you've given us to come in here, to open up your word, uh, to be able to read from it freely, Father, to be able to come to you, Father, with uh, all of our heart and our soul, Father. So just ask that you just be with each and every one in this room. Open up our hearts and our minds, Father. Allow us to know, Father, that uh, through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, Father, that we are not alone, um, especially as we're talking about something as sensitive as emotional and mental health. So, Father, just please use me as you uh, see fit um, and pierce the hearts that need to be pierced, Father. Soften the ones that need to be softened, Father. But above all else, Father, uh, we're grateful for your Son, Jesus Christ, and we just pray this in his holy, precious name. Amen. So if you don't have a Bible, uh, or if you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the chair back in front of you, so we'd love for you to grab a copy, keep a copy, write your name on it, take it home with you. Um, but if you have your Bible, we're going to start off in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Uh, I get, that's kind of been our series verse. Um, if you don't have one, it's also on the screen there. But Paul starts off by saying, don't you realize that in every race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we, we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. 
I discipline my body like an athlete, training it what it should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching my, to others and I myself might be disqualified. Another reason, one of the things I love that verse there is because Scripture makes it very clear for anybody who is a teacher, anybody who's a pastor, overseer, anybody who considers themselves a Christian, if you are going to teach something you do not have, but treat, treat it as, or speak it as truth, all right, you are going to be a little bit more harshly judged than anybody else. And so you can't give what you don't have. And this isn't one of those things in life that you can fake until you make it. All right? What Paul is talking about is intentionality and being able to train yourself. And so if you've known me for a while, you know that I love volleyball. I love coaching volleyball. It's something that uh, makes up about 20 years of my life coaching for various high schools and clubs in this area. And it's one of the things that when I came into coach, it wasn't just because I wanted to fill some sort of after-school activity. Like, my players knew that when they came on to play, that we were playing for a reason. And it wasn't just 100% for the W's. Yes, winning is awesome. Who doesn't like to win, right? Maybe the Cowboys don't, but that's a whole other story. All right? Or the Ravens, let's be honest. All right? No, but in all seriousness, it's one of those things where... They understood the culture that I was trying to create. It was a culture of we are going to win on the court and we are going to win off the court. We're going to put in the training five to six days a week so that way when we go to execute come game day, all right, we're relying on our training. We're not trying to do anything new. Our muscles know exactly what it is we're going to do and we're going to go and do our best. Nothing but our best. But then you're going to take all of those things and you're going to apply it to what it means to your academics, what it means to live a life, like building blocks for what you should be prepared for post high school. And that is what this series has been all about, is your life is all tied together. How you do in one area of all the things that we talked about affects the other areas of your life. Um, I had a counselor once told me that think of your life almost as like a three-legged stool. All right? You need to take care of your physical health, your emotional health, um, and your spiritual health, all right? And any one of those you don't take care of before you know it, and you may be it again, fake it until you make it, but eventually that leg is going to fall off and that stool is going to fall. And so the same thing will happen into your life if you are not putting in the training and the discipline that is required to win this race. Again, not a trophy, But our trophy, right, is that eternal prize in Jesus Christ when we get to rest with him in forever. Amen? All right. And so I got to share last year my story, my journey of 17 years of dealing with various mental health issues with depression and anxiety. And for the first six, six and a half years of that, I did exactly that. I would stuff. I would stuff. I would ignore the feelings. I would fill the void with something else instead of addressing what those issues were. And you can only do that for so long before your body starts manifesting and the real feelings of different stress levels affect your body and pain or confusion or brain fog or whatever it may be, all right, when you don't address it, it's going. And that is your body's way of communicating with you that something is not right and you need to pay attention because the longer you put it off, all right, the more in pain emotionally, mentally, and physically you are going to be. And so almost five, six, well, actually at this point in 2018, you know, I resigned my position here at the church as a pastor. And I had reached a point because I was ignoring everything that I should have been paying attention to that I eventually got to the point where I was 100% burned out. I could not do it anymore. I, we just finished this beautiful reconstruction project. I was not putting in the time for myself or my family. It was just work, 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 work. And then eventually my body crashed. And I got to a point, I was like, I need to take a hiatus. I need to resign my position and focus on something different because I'm not doing what God has called me to do. And so my family and I, we moved down to Lynchburg, Virginia. And that is where I realized all of the work that I needed to do. And so many plans we have in our heart, but ultimately it's God, it's the Lord that's going to direct all of our steps. 
And I don't regret resigning when I did back in 2018 because there was a 12-month period in Lynchburg that I needed to refocus on my mental, physical, spiritual, family health to understand that when God calls somebody into ministry, um, even to be a Christian, I would add, really isn't for the faint of heart. There is a lot of work and intentionality that needs to happen into it. And so it allowed me to realize that when I came back into ministry, that I had some safeguards, some boundaries that I had to put in place and understood first and foremost what God wanted me to do. And so I had shared then that it was embarrassing and I was even ashamed to call myself a pastor at that time because I allowed myself to spiral out of control. And so the lie that I believed, all right, and I'll show you the scripture in a minute, but the lie that I believed that the one that is in this world, Satan, is greater than the one that lives in me, which is the spirit. That was the lie that I was believing. And so when you read in 1 John 4, 4, and I'll put it on the screen here, is, but you, me, belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the one who lives in the world. That was the truth that I had to believe. And it goes so much deeper than just reading the scripture. You have to personalize the scripture. You have to make this scripture yours. What is God trying to communicate to me with this scripture? Change, don't change, but add your name to where the yous are. But you, Mac, belong to God, my dear child. You, Mac, have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you, Mac, is greater than the one, Satan, who lives in this world. That is what John was trying to communicate here. Because the Apostle Paul, I think, knew better than anybody else what it meant to wrestle with his flesh, wrestling the spiritual and the fleshly side. And you read in Romans 7, 15 through 17, Paul says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what is right, excuse me, but if I know what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good, so I am not the one doing wrong. It is the sin that is living in me that does it. And so if you're not careful in reading the context here, you could think that Paul is saying, well, it's the sin's fault. It's not my fault. It's the sin's fault. And that's not what Paul is saying at all. Paul is saying he isn't responsible, excuse me, that he is responsible for his sinful actions. He has written that even though he wants to do good, he ends up doing with what he hates instead, which is sin. His personal desire to do the right thing, to obey God's law, and even in Paul's case, somebody who grew up as a devout Jewish man, that was not enough to keep him from disobeying God. The attraction of sin is won out over Paul's sincere interest in doing right. And anytime you read scripture and you talks about sin, it always paints this picture of that it's pleasing. It's not pleasing. It's like there's an appetite to it. Like there's this desire. It's calling out to you. It wants you. And as humans, we want to be wanted. I'm going to put this quote on the screen from uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle. And it says that our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Y'all need to write this down. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. In other words, if you change your mind, you will change your life. Thoughts are constantly pulling us in every direction. And I'm curious because I hope I'm not the only one in here, but is there anyone else in here that struggles with this war in your mind of all of these thoughts that are just absolutely driving you crazy? And I appreciate, those raise your hands, I, I, I appreciate you because you are not alone. <laughs> if this is you, then this is a book that you need to get. It's called Winning the War in Your Mind by Pastor Craig Rochelle. And what he says in here is that the mind is a battlefield. And most of life's battles are won or lost in your mind. 
I don't know about you, but so often I battle in my mind between the thoughts of faith and the thoughts of fear. I often want to trust God, but I also know that I don't want to give up control. And so maybe you're like this. Maybe you can walk in one moment, you can feel this full spiritual confidence that God is with you, that God has called you, that he is for you, and in the next moment, you have this crippling insecurity that paralyzes you and it holds you back. If the mind is a battlefield and our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts, and if we're already in a dark place, just simply trying to survive, what do we do? Like, is it possible to get through this? Well, let me start with the science first. Science says that in neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to recognize itself by forming new neural pathways throughout life and in response to experiences. While the brain usually does this itself in response to injury or disease, when humans, pay attention to this part, when humans focus their attention, they can slowly rewire the pathways themselves. So let's take a look at some of these statistics here. One in five U.S. adults experience mental illness each year. One in 20 U.S. adults experience serious mental illness each year. One in six U.S. US youth-aged 6 to 17-year-old kids experience a mental health disorder each year. 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins by the age of 14 and by 75% and 75% by age 24. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 10 to 14 years old. How does this not shake us to our core in being able to take mental health serious? I have two daughters that are within that age range. I would be crushed if I didn't pay attention and take mental health seriously. So if these are the current statistics, and these numbers since 2020 have only gotten worse, is the renewing of our minds possible? Or is it just more of survival of the fittest? Is it more of just saying, suck it up, buttercup? Is it simply like, Elsa, right, from Frozen, who has the lyrics and let it go, that the wind is howling like the storm inside, couldn't keep it in, heaven knows that I tried. Don't let them in, don't let them see, be the good girl you always have to be, conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. This is where I love when science always points back to our creator. Paul tells us in Romans 12 2, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It is absolutely possible to renew your mind. It is possible to live the life that God has called you to live. The biggest truth that any one of us in this room needs to believe in our heart, in our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, that we are not alone in this. And you need to leave here today with the understanding that you are either needing help and knowing that you have people here or you know that I'm not currently struggling with this, but the statistics would say there is somebody else in your circle that needs this help. We all have a job to do. We all have work to do. One of my favorite songs when I was first battling with this, and I was finally paying attention to it, was a song called, I Am No Longer a Slave. I No Longer Fear. And I believe it's by Bethel. And But after I watched this video... 
And this, if you haven't seen this video on YouTube, it's one of their special versions of it. And here you are singing over and over again that I will no longer be a slave to sin. And it's one of those things that when you sing something over and over and over again, all right, you're proclaiming it. And that's what it means to do the work. It means you are proclaiming, I am no longer a slave to fear. I am no longer a slave to fear. All right? That is the truth. I am no longer a slave for fear because I am a child of God. And there's a part in that song where she just over and over and over go, just starts off saying, you know what? I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. And then she just goes louder, I am a child of God. And as I'm listening to this, I have my iPad and I'm writing, and the words on my iPad are getting bigger and bigger that I am a child of God. I have tears running down my face right now because I am believing what I should have believed when I first became a Christian, but I am a child of God. So I will no longer be a slave to fear. Satan has no control in my life. I'm telling you, there was a time I was laying in my bed and I'm listening to the demonic thoughts of just saying, you can end it right now. And all of that pain goes away. But I said, no. I am a child of God. And I keep repeating myself. And so when it comes to scripture, like I'm going to read in here uh, in a moment, you have to understand that that scripture is not just for you to read, but it is for you to internalize. It's for you to pray on. It's for you to meditate on over and over and over until you get it. You are building those roots deep. And this woman right here, she doesn't know me. I don't know her. But as I watched the video, I noticed this comment that was made under the video. And, and I couldn't put it on the screen because it just didn't, I guess, copyright. But her, what she said on here, and I, this really, God used her. I struggle with anxiety and occasional panic attacks. This is Rachel talking here. Whenever I face a particularly anxiety-inducing situation, I like to turn to this song, I turn the song on, and God's peace immediately floods over me. God hasn't taken away, he hasn't healed my anxiety or depression, but he has endlessly and repeatedly showered me with the peace and joy that comes from him only. When I can experience this peace, I can view my mental health as a blessing. Yes, it is a struggle, but I am experiencing in excess the peace and joy that only the Lord can give. And so when I read scripture, like uh, Psalm 16.8, and this was one of the first ones that I memorized, it says, I know that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. And so when we read and pray over Scripture, we must be bold enough, confident enough within our relationship with God that He will do 100% of what He says He's going to do. Other translations use the phrase that I shall not be moved in place of I will not be shaken. But both expressions underscore David's unwavering conviction. They expressed that David relied on the Lord wholeheartedly. Imagine a, fam or excuse me, a tree that's firmly rooted into the ground, a house that's built on a strong foundation, or a courageous soldier that's holding up the battle line. Or think about this, a teenager standing up to a bully because he has his big brother or friend standing right beside him. We can face life's challenges knowing that God is with us. When David says, at my right hand, the ancients used this phrase to symbolize that a person's ultimate source of strength and power. We were designed, each and every one of us, to rely on the truth of God. And we replace him, and when we replace him, with idols. And even the mental ones. They are inevitable consequences, especially in our minds. So when you're feeling like you are in the storm of your life, it certainly does. I'm telling you 17 years later, I'm saying it, it certainly does feel like it's a lifetime. But I want to give the illustration, and a former pastor of ours, Chris Comstock, I watched him do a sermon on this. The difference between in these storms, are you going to be a buffalo or are you going to be a cow? Because when a cow sees a storm coming, they lay down. And they just wait for the storm to come. 
They have no idea how big the storm is, how strong it is, how severe. That all they know is the storm is coming and I lie down. But a buffalo, on the other hand, when they see a storm coming, they don't lie down. They face the storm. And then they start walking into the storm. Because they have realized that once you start walking into that storm, that storm can only be so big. I'm going to make it through that storm a heck of a lot faster than if I just try to sit and wait it out and just hope that it goes away. So when you are feeling that storm, you need to be that buffalo. And that's something that you need to internalize. Because as I mentioned, with dealing with anxiety and depression, um, it has not, I don't want you to think over the 17 years that has controlled me this entire time. There became a time when I started doing the work and got to the point of where I said, you know what, I can start doing exactly what God wants me to do. We sang a song earlier, um, Firm Foundations. And I love the lyrics. That's become one of my more recent anthem songs. And it says, I've still got joy and chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. Because even in the depths of mental struggles, we find explicable joy and peace in Christ's presence. Another scripture that I would hold on to and internalize is from Matthew 7, 24 through 27. And he's talking about the difference between two builders here. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and it beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had the foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." So the bottom line in this scripture right here is those who place their trust in Christ will have an unshakable foundation. But let's, before we break this down, let's look at foundations from a different perspective. If there are any, so when you look at a skyscraper, all right, you may think that it is an incredible skyscraper. But what you don't know is the type of foundation that is holding up the skyscraper, skyscraper. Right? If you ever want to know how tall a skyscraper is going to be before it's built, look at where they're building it and look how deep they're building that foundation. And so what I want to do is I want to show you the top five of the largest building skyscrapers in the world, but not just show you the buildings, but what's even more surprising to me is actually how deep some of these foundations go. The first one is the World Trade Center here in New York. In New York. It stands at 1,791 feet. Its foundation, it has what they call 192 concrete piles that have been drilled down to a depth of 164 feet. Just imagine the depth of this foundation, three of these ACC buildings stacked on top of each other into the ground to support a 1,700-foot building. Then you have the Burj Khalifa in the United Arab Emirates. This one stands at 2,716 feet, but it actually doesn't have one of the deepest foundations. Nonetheless, its 192 concrete piles have been drilled down, drilled down to a depth of 164 feet. You have Taipei 101 in Taiwan. That's a 1,667-foot building. But that has a 380 concrete piles drilled down at 262 feet. And uh, then you have the Shanghai Tower in China. That's 2,000 plus square, or 2,000 feet tall. That has to, because of their frequent earthquakes, that has a foundation that is 282 feet deep, but it has an astronomical 832 reinforced concrete piles that are driven down 282 feet. And the number one is the Petronas Towers in Malaysia, and that's only 1,483. I say only, but that's two towers with a bridge that connects the two buildings that only has 104 
concrete piles in there, but it's at a massive depth of 400 plus feet to be able to keep this building secure because of the foundation that's around it. So what is all of this, all right, showing these images, what does all of this have to do with mental health? So if Jesus is telling us that the only difference between the wise man and the foolish man is what they built their house on, this tells us that the foundation that we have as Christians matters. It tells us that not only how deep is the foundation needed, if you want to, again, as I mentioned, tell how tall a skyscraper is, look at the foundation. So verse 24 says, anyone who listens to my message, and now verse 26 says, anyone who hears my message. It's saying the same thing at the building. The similarities between these two building builders is they both came in and heard the word of God. All right? It didn't matter what they were building, they both came in and heard the word of God. Both of them decided they wanted to build a house. Both faced a storm. We have to let the Bible be more than just head knowledge. We have to let it be your deep foundation that's deeply rooted in every fiber of your body. Listening to advice, choosing to work on our mental health, and dealing with tough times show how we know what we have, what tools that we have, and how we can build up our emotional and mental strength, and how tough we are when we are facing life's hard moments. This parable from Jesus tells us how we are to be actively wise and making ourselves mentally and emotionally strong. So differing outcomes, right? Both of them came in with the same plan to build. So the storm can be seen as a metaphor how people cope with stress, how they deal with trauma, how they deal with adversity. Because those who have built their mental resilience, like the house on the rock, are more likely to withstand and recover from these challenges. Like this t-shirt that I'm wearing. I don't... I love t-shirts, and I typically don't buy a t-shirt just because there's something funny on it. I usually like to wear t-shirts because it's speaking to me more than it's speaking to anybody else. And it just simply says, I will not quit. And on the back it says, you may see me struggle, but you will not see me quit. And that is the mindset that I have had to have. Um, seen the uh, movie Facing the Giants? All right. I love sports movies. And this is a Christian-based one, but there's a scene of where there's this player who's doubting whether or not they have a chance to win this game coming up. And so he tells them, I want you to get down and do something called the death crawl. All right? And in addition to the death crawl, starting at one end zone and going to the other, I'm going to put somebody on your back. And he's like, I think I could probably go to the 20-yard line with nobody on your back. And he says, no, I think you can go 50 yards with someone in your back. And just to make sure you don't quit on yourself, I'm going to blindfold you. And I want you to listen to my voice. And when you're looking at the players, uh, the one on the ground, the one on his back, and the other teammates on there, you begin to realize that this coach, you know, if you're breaking it down, is God. The player on the ground doing the death crawl is us. The one player on his back is the weight of the world, all of the things that we don't want to let go of. And then you have the other players who are the world who are kind of joking and making fun of us like, that's not going to be possible. He can't do that. But all of a sudden, he starts. And he gets to a certain point where he can really feel it in his muscles that he can't hold on anymore. He can't do it. But the coach keeps telling him, don't quit. Don't quit. Keep moving. You have more strength than you know. It is in you. Nego do not negotiate with that pain. Just endure the pain. Go through it. There's a purpose. I've got you. And he's telling them this over and over and over again. And finally the player collapses on the ground and he's crying out that I can't do this anymore. I don't have any more energy. I can't do it. I failed. And so he tells them, take the blind off. And he said, when he took the blind off, he said, you're in the end zone. But while all of this is happening, the world, 
the players are watching him. And as he progressed and got stronger and kept moving and he didn't quit, which they were all thinking, again, they all ruled out that they were done for this Sunday. They had no chance to win. And then all of a sudden, you see each of them one by one start standing up and looking and it's like, ah, oh, I think he's going to actually do this. And all of a sudden, the joking, everything became quiet. And so you silence the world through your actions. The world will eventually see what it is that you're doing, and they're going to ask you about it. And when you look at 1 Peter 3, 14 through 17, it says, but even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for doing it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if then, excuse me, if that is what God wants, then to suffer for doing wrong. Let the world see what you are doing that is different. Let them ask the questions and then you be ready to respond with them gently and with respect of that foundation that you have built in your life that is built on Jesus Christ. That is the only foundation that will keep you from falling, cracking, crumbling, succumbing to life. Just like the city skyscraper needs a deep foundation to handle anything we humans or nature throws at its way to stay standing, just like the Paul talks about the athlete in 1 Corinthians 9 needing self-control and discipline in order to run in such a way to win the prize. Just like that song, the firm foundation that we sang early, earlier, in the midst of our mental health outcomes, storms, we are utilizing scripture to renew our minds. Paul says in Philippians 4, 8 through 9, to what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable, think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, and it's at that point then the peace of God will be with you. So let's remember the unshakable truth Christ is our firm foundation, the rock in which we stand. When everything else is shaking, our faith in him remains steadfast. Embrace the words that I still have joy and chaos, even when it makes no sense. Even in the depths of mental struggles, we will find that inexplicable joy and peace in Christ's presence. We need to proclaim, it means to shout out, that when the winds, when the rain comes down, and the wind blew, but my house was built on you, that our mental resilience is like a house built on Christ, unyielding and secure, no, many, no matter how fierce the storm may be. Understand that I am not held by my own strength. Be inspired by the song's bold declaration, so why would he fail now? Because he won't. He won't. In moments of doubt and struggle, remember Christ's support in our mental health journey is unfailing because Christ is my firm foundation. So as we persevere in mental health, let's trust in God's unwavering promise and commitment of support and love. Think about that buffalo. I tell you, look up and Google an image of a bus buffalo facing a storm and you will be encouraged. So remember this quote by Louis Giglio. It is okay to not be okay. You can tell yourself that. It is okay to not be okay. Because Jesus is okay. So we always end our services in a three-word prayer. What now, God? What do you want me to do with this information? What do we do with all 
five weeks of this information on running to win. And we've ended them all the same way. Put the good stuff in. Encouraging, filling our minds with a positive, healthy, and godly thoughts. Just like I read in Philippians 4, 8. Think about what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Get involved more regularly, corporately, with your brothers and sisters in Christ here on a Sunday morning. Get involved in our life groups. Do life with one another. Serve on a ministry team. We don't just have a parking team because they want to help people find parking spots. They serve on a parking team because they generally are invested in one another on that team. There's this spiritual formation that happens when it becomes, hey, I know you were dealing with this last week. Uh, how, are you, how are you doing with whatever? So again, what they do, they just they help people find parking spots and it makes it safe for everybody. But that's not why they're doing what they're doing. We have prayer teams. We have tons of activities that happen in the church. So those are the good things that you need to keep putting in. We need to keep the junk out. Stress the importance. You need to guard your hearts and your minds against negativity and harmful influences. You have Proverbs 4.23 that says, guard your heart above all else. Practical step here. I cannot make you feel a certain way just like you can't make me feel a certain way. And that was probably one of the hardest truths I've ever had to learn. You made me... No. I allowed myself to feel that way. And that's where you start learning how do I put boundaries in place? You know, uh, one of my counselors, she mentioned that imagine your, your hand on a gate to yourself, to your house. You control who comes in and out of your life. And so as long as your hand is on that gate, you're not allowing people to come in and you're sounding a firm boundary. But if you open up that gate, you are allowing something to come in. And so that's a truth that I had to learn and, and, to, wor- and to work on. So setting boundaries is important. Exercise, even the physical exercise, get that serotonin moving throughout your body. It's great for your mental health. Godliness has value for all things, 1 Timothy 4, 8 says. But in addition to that, regular prayer and meditation, all right? There's a difference between a trench and a rut. Ruts are unintentional, all right? You walk around the same path over and over hundreds of times, you're going to develop a rut there. But the way you get out of that rut is you have to intentionally turn a different direction and start intentionally digging a trench deeper and deeper, all right, that's going to change the way your brain, your synapses are communicating with one another. And so instead of uh, repeating the same negative thoughts over and over again, you're now exercising your brain saying, I'm now going to take the scripture I have. I'm going to proclaim it, meditate it, and I pray on it. And I'm going to form a new pathway that's going to establish a new connection. And you do that over and over and over again. And then you're strengthening your mental health that way. And then be careful. Emphasize being vigilant about our mental and emotional health. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be alert and of sober mind. We need to practice regular self-reflection and seeking counsel and support when needed. So regardless of our circumstances, we can walk comfortably, confidently knowing that we are secure in his hands both now and ultimately in eternity. Father God, there's I understand there's a lot to deal with when it comes to, to mental health. Um, and, and it can totally be a, a scary road to walk down on. But Father, we know that you are with us 100, 100% of the way. And I know that there are times that you don't let go of us, Father. There are times that we just simply step outside of your will. And so Father, thank you for being that God, that Father that always allows us to turn and come right back to you with your arms open wide. So, Father, just ask anybody that's in here that uh, is struggling, Father, that they seek you wholeheartedly, Father, with all of their soul, mind, and strength to know that you have a plan for them, Father, to heal them, that this isn't the life you want them to live. So, God, we're grateful for the time. We're grateful for your son, Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the truths that you allow us to have. But most importantly, Father, through your son, Jesus Christ, who is our firm foundation, we can live for him and only him, Father, and know that we will one day see you in eternity. So please guide each and every one of us, and we pray this in your son's name.
Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.